Thank you very much, Jason. Um, Jeremy Hunt giveth with one hand and taketh with the other. Now, I sat there with the team yesterday for an hour and 10 minutes, so you didn't have to. Uh, I was waiting for the income tax bunny to appear. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't. Uh, and I think he was haunted by Liz Truss, uh, currently in recession, boxed in by the suits at the OBR, uh, and those people won't let debt grow faster than GDP. So I came away thinking this was absolutely not a pre-election budget, but it was still a very political budget. Now, his main political pork pie is on the slide above. Hidden away, page 68 of the OBR's document, is the fact that Jeremy Hunt's planning to raise twice as much in additional tax by freezing thresholds as he will be cutting back national insurance. Um, not a coherent tax strategy, I don't think, to go into an election. Much more on that later on. All the talking heads had it as a key marker ahead of the election, possibly the last big set piece for the embattled Tories to get into the short campaign on the back of. So I wanted to focus my update on the UK and in that context. And what I'm going to try and do is look at the facts from the recent past, the promises of the present, and finish up with some predictions for the future. So I'm fully caffeinated, uh, high octane, and uh, feeling fairly opinionated this morning. So please do strap in. We'll start with the past. Now, I think that all roads lead to tax, and that what, that's what the roadmap is trying to suggest up there. Why do I say that? It's because you design a society by the way in which you tax it. There can't be any public services without tax. We can't fight wars without tax. It's not just an end of year paper exercise. So this is my map of the recent past. And what I'm going to do is a broad brush of the gray boxes. And I call those official taxes. Uh, and my learned colleagues who know more about these things are going to go into the detail on that after me. Uh, but then you'll have to indulge me because uh, I'm going to try and persuade you that the orange boxes, debt and inflation, are also basically taxation. And uh, I call it unofficial taxation. Uh, but I'm going to talk about that. Now, I've set a reference point. Jason's already mentioned 2010, May 2010, when David Cameron came into power. Uh, so I'm going to be looking from that date. Uh, and let's start by looking broadly at these grey boxes. So what's on the slide there is from the previous autumn statement. But it's, that was 22nd of November last year. But it's near as damn it as the latest outturn that we saw yesterday. This is what we accountants would call a source and application of funds. So if I start on the left. For 23-24, the OBR expects to raise just over a trillion pounds. So that's about 37 grand per household. And it expects to spend about 1.2 trillion pound on things like public services, state pensions, and debt interest. That's 42 grand per household. So the 132 billion difference is the deficit. So this is a negative number that accrues to the national debt. And you need to watch politicians who talk about reducing the deficit, because that is, of course, still increasing the debt. One of Hunt's fiscal rules is keeping that deficit at less than 3% of GDP in five years' time. So this particular measure is on track for that. What I've done on the right is to split out where the money comes from and how it's spent. So you can see 90% of the money comes from tax. The rest comes from uh, other investments like uh, foreign currency reserves. So 50% of that, 57% of that is from the big boys, from VAT and income tax. The spending, the bit that's averaging 42 grand per family, is mostly public services, capital investments, and welfare payments. Now, defense always stands out to me and appears very modest in these presentations. Um, there's nothing on that yesterday which kind of surprised me. So, but what you can see, 32.4 billion, about 1.4% of GDP spent on defense. And that's on the back of a 12 billion pledge to Ukraine. That was something that was omitted yesterday and it kind of caught my, my attention. Here I really illustrate uh, 
uh, Mr. Hunt's political pork pie, and I, I'm going to make no apologies for continuing to come back to this this morning. Uh, and speaking of pork and pig gate, when David Cameron came to power, the tax take was 32.2% of GDP. Now that projected outturn that I've just shown you for 23-24 has this at 36.1% of GDP, rising to 37.1% of GDP by the end of the forecast period, so 28-29. Now, just for reference, the OECD average of developed economies is around 34%. So I'm going to use another animal for a metaphor, and it's the elephant in the room. My erstwhile partner, Graham Doubtfire, always reminds me of this fiscal drag, and that's the chart that you have there on the right. It was back in 2021 when then-Chancellor Sunak decided to freeze the personal tax thresholds until 2026, and when Hunt took office, he reaffirmed that and confirmed the freezes till 2026. Now, well, the OBR says that the uh, government will pocket £44.6 billion in 2029 thanks to this policy. And you can see from the chart that a big reason for that is those 3 million additional people in that shaded area who are being dragged into the higher rates. So let me be absolutely clear. The effect of this is equivalent to raising the basic rate from 20 pence to 26 pence. It's hardly a cut. And that's why the political rhetoric around tax cuts uh, slightly irritates me. Let's talk about employment. Now, the rate of unemployment's almost historic lows. It's about 3.8%. But what that statistic hides are the number of people that are not actually looking for work. We know that the number of people on out-of-work benefits is about 5.6 million. We haven't seen levels that high since the dark days of lockdown and before that since the early 90s. What's interesting to me is the lion's share of that, 2.8 million, are people who are on long-term sickness. And a statistic that really blew my mind is that there are 4,000 applications for sickness benefits currently being submitted every single day. The difference between now and the 90s is that there are jobs available now. And of course, back then, there weren't. So the issues do seem to be around sickness. The Chancellor was talking in the context of there being 20 million adults out of the workforce. That's 37.2% of the population, 0.4% more than when Cameron came to power. And a stark chunk of that is this sickness issue. I don't know the reason for that. Is it habits since COVID? Is it structural issues to do with the benefit system? Generational differences? Older workers not returning to the office? Is it that mental health is an issue? Medical services not coping with health issues? The changing nature of the economy? I am not sure that ministers have the answers. I'm not sure that they even particularly want to address the questions. But one thing that is clear, the welfare bill does little to help the chancellor with his tax cutting ambitions. Very quick digression on GDP. GDP methodology, the calculations for doing this is not perfect for various technical reasons. But when you look at the data on a consistent basis, it does give us a trend. Um, a UK GDP, about two thirds of it is consumer spending, 20% government expenditure, and the rest is business investment. GDP last year was about 2.3 trillion, 32 grand per head. And that's really important because the Chancellor was talking yesterday about GDP per capita. That's a really important number for him because that's how well off we, the voters, feel when we go to put our X in a box. And that number per head has not moved since Cameron's time. On the left, I've scaled the data to 100 and I've plotted GDP for the term of the current government. And you can see if I annualize the average growth for the UK, it's 1.44%. And I was playing about with some numbers. I wanted to compare it with the largest economy in the world, the US. And I wanted to compare it with another economy, France, which is seventh after us, sixth in the, in the world. So I did some numbers. And you can see for the same period, the US was 4.8% annualized. And France was 0.44%. Now, clearly, France and the US are very different economies. Um, you know, in France, I understand you can probably retire on an index-linked pension at 55. Uh, and in the US, it's difficult to take any holiday at all. And it has huge natural resources. Correlation isn't causation. But if we look at industrial electricity prices, that's a big factor of, of uh, productivity. Uh, and the International Energy Agency published uh, the wonderful uh, In the Thick of It-esque department, DESNES, Department for Energy Security and Net Zero for these countries for the same period. And I think that chart's quite interesting. Reliable, cheap energy 
is key to productivity, and, and this does illustrate a particular challenge we have in the United Kingdom. So in the period since 2010, a story of anemic productivity but increasing tax take, which is, as Jason said, rather inevitable since COVID, increasing energy costs, but this issue of worklessness also really arising post-pandemic. Uh, there are two, I'll call them quasi-taxes, that I consider even stealthier than fiscal drag. Uh, and let's start with the legacy of debt that we're building for our children. So I've got to admit, you know, debt is not literally a tax, but you can view it as one in the way in which the government uses it. Remember the slide with the 132 billion deficit plugging the public finances? Um, you know, that is, that is debt used as a tax lever. Uh, the UK national debt, currently about 2.5 trillion. The US national debt, $33 trillion. And as you can see on that slide, almost every developed nation in the world has a government debt problem. Now, questions often ask, who is the money actually owed to? In the case of the UK, about a quarter of it is owed by the Bank of, owned by the Bank of England. So it effectively prints the money to buy the debt. Another quarter held by foreign countries and foreign investments, and the rest by banks, building societies, pension funds, insurance companies, and investors. And now, just to get this into context, the, the, the bond markets are ginormous. They make the stock markets look like a market stall. And I've come to realize that much of this money is unlikely ever to be paid back without some sort of complete devaluation of currency. It's a problem that's almost unsolvable and a problem that politicians basically ignore. Deficits continue to accrue and debt mounts. Um, the squeeze on government finances gets incrementally greater and that's more of a problem in an era of higher interest rates. So not only is this effectively a tax on the future, uh, to use the cry of American revolutionaries, it's taxation without representation. Like debt, inflation isn't officially a tax, but it doesn't mean to say it doesn't exist. As uh, Maynard Keynes says here, it's often deliberately propagated uh, and its effect is the same. It confiscates wealth from one party and transfers it to another party. Now, the television always irritates me because it will usually define inflation as raising prices and deflation as falling prices. But I always ask rising and falling prices in what? As central banks, when they do their basket, ignore inflation in house prices and in financial assets and focus on certain consumer products. And those products are prone to deflationary forces of improved productivity. So I prefer the traditional Austrian school definition. Inflation is always an expansion of money supply. And this goes back many years. Roman emperors reduced the amount of gold and silver in coin. Today's central bankers suppress interest rates and employ quantitative easing. The intention is the same, to devalue money, you devalue debt, and you lighten your obligations. But it also confiscates value from anybody that holds money. Taxation without representation again. And I was looking at a graph yesterday which shows the price of gold. So gold is currently about 1,500 quid an ounce. At the turn of the last century, it was 150 pounds an ounce. So 10 times. Now, gold is something that's enduring. It's, at least according to the song, indestructible. Uh, the ring on your finger existed before the earth was created. Now, I do admit that I'm a bit of a gold bug, but it's clear to me that it's not gold that has increased in value. It's the money used to buy it which has been debauched. Uh, it is the money which basically has lost 90% of its purchasing power. And if you look at that slide, since 1971, when the US left the gold standard uh, and uh, money was printed to fight the Vietnam War. Frankly, I think that's absolutely nuts. But the context of all of this, and why I'm telling you about it, is because it sets the scene for all of the promises of yesterday. So against that scene, what we, what we saw yesterday was the OBR tweaking short-term forecasts since last November and not getting any challenge of it because Hunt is haunted by the Truss administration. I find it very funny, but also a bit insulting at the same time, uh, that the government always claims that raging inflation is outside of its control and down to global factors, whilst also saying that it's them that have brought it under control. Um, you know, the past 12 months have seen about five years' worth of price rises built into the voters' cost of living. So what that has created 
is uh, a slump in demand and deflationary environment. So what the OBR was saying yesterday is the market's expecting a sharper decline of interest rates, and that's perversely strengthened near-term prospects against the low bar. But the medium-term prospects are still suffering those issues of a growing population uh, offset by workforce inactivity. So you know, Hunt only had a very thin sliver of headroom to work with. I'm not going to let this drop, just so you know, uh, I turned to page 150 of the OBR document first, and I crunched the numbers uh, on the tax point, really to prove to myself where I thought it was that the overall tax take is still, fo still forecast to rise. And the same thing is shown on the graph here. But back to those deflationary forces, forces and the, the impact on uh, interest rates. Uh, this was graphed in the OBR document, and you can see the effect of that sharper decline forecast with an expectation, um, in case you're interested, of around 4% next year. One graph I didn't put in the pack uh, was around the number of job vacancies, which is moving back towards pre-pandemic levels, and it's loosening as well. So that's having another effect on inflation. Uh, so here are my hot takes from yesterday um, in three points. The public sector productivity improvements, I thought, were doing a lot of heavy lifting in the budget presentation. Um, the overall tax burden continues to rise. I've checked that three times. Uh, and it simply didn't feel like a pre-election budget. I think we may all well be here before the year is out again. So what of the future? And this bit comes with a rather large disclaimer and health warning. But one of the ratios that I've been tracking, which is quite interesting, is something called the velocity of money, as uh, reported in the USA. Now, the velocity of money is basically a measure of the rate at which money is exchanged in an economy. So if you have a high velocity of money, when the chart there is going up, it means that currency is being used frequently in transactions and a, you have a vibrant and thriving economy. Uh, when you have a, a low velocity of money, when it's going down, it means that money is pretty stagnant and transactions are infrequent. And the point here is that velocity of money has contracted to a lower level than at any point during the Great Recession and the World Wars. And my concern, based on what I said a moment ago, is that the ability to produce growth by printing money has basically now been exhausted. So something has to give. The system needs some sort of reset. Now, I have some ideas about what that might be, and I'm happy to talk about that afterwards if you're interested. My basic theory, though, is that with such a fundamental monetary parameter, like the velocity of money in the world's biggest economy, things could happen very quickly in this OBR forecast period. So it's never been more important for all of us in business to main maintain focus on change. You need to think about what your leading indicator KPIs are, and this is why. The hike in interest rates that we saw over the last 12 to 18 months has been a global phenomenon. And the impact of such rate rises is always lagging 12 or 18 months following that. And so we're starting to see that now. Money can't be printed at the historic rates of uh, money printing and at the current interest rates without some sort of death spiral. So what do we think is going to happen? Well, there's more of a risk that loans will default, that collateral will be collected, and the indicators all suggest that this is a real period to buckle up and to weather and to get through to the other side. But it's also, of course, a period of opportunity for those strong businesses. I think it's always important to uh, end on a positive with a bit of optimism. Um, as JFK put it more eloquently, we got ourselves into this position, so we can get ourselves out of it. I think it's more important than ever that we all show a real interest in, and engagement in the way that we are taxed. It is how societies are defined. We all can help shape it in the future in our own way. I think it's highly unlikely that the medium, medium of exchange will uh, remain as cash. I think we're heading into a period where there's going to be some form of digital currency in the medium term. And if that happens, if currency is going to be digitized, then I think it's really important that it should be decoupled from government fiat, from government decree. It should be decentralized. I think it's really incumbent on us all to think about these things 
and to do whatever we can to influence them in our own businesses and our own voting lives. Now, I'm out of time now, but all of those that know me know that I can't do a presentation without quoting Milton Friedman, so that's what I'm doing on this slide. Uh, I'll leave you with his words on crisis and change, which I think have never been more resonant than they are today. I'm now going to welcome Simon Huron to the stage, and Simon is going to guide us through some of the detail on private tax. And just want to finish by saying, if, if you were listening, Thank you very much and be very happy to talk about anything after the event. Thank you.